Hello, my friends. Pastor Wes here, and it's time for a study in God's Word. And I really believe today that it's going to really challenge your thinking. Perhaps you'll hear some things maybe you've not heard before. But we're going to look into God's Word. If you have a Bible and would like to join us, we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. The last part of this verse is so important, perhaps one of the most important theological verses in the Bible, where it says, for this purpose, listen carefully, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. It begins by talking about the very purpose that the Son of God, Jesus, was manifest, or in other words, the reason he came. I want to take that lens and widen it out a little bit. And let's look at not only the reason Jesus came, the whole reason why we're here in the first place, the purpose of creation, why it is that uh, we are here for what purpose. I want to talk today not about your purpose in life, but about what God's purpose for you is in your life. Title of this message is The Purpose of God. You know, it's amazing to me how many people will begin a religious lifestyle, perhaps because they're following in the footsteps of their parents, tradition, many other reasons, but this is how religion was started in the first place, because people didn't understand the purpose of God. And yet they jump right into religious activities. And this is how we can get so far off in what we believe. It all begins with understanding why are we here in the first place? What is the purpose of God for having us here, creating Adam? All the chaos as well as the great things that have taken place since then. What was the whole purpose in this or the purpose of God? We're going to take some time to examine that together in light of God's word. But to do so, let's look carefully at this verse again. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested and came. Why? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, the first question that often comes to people's minds, and I've been asked this through the years many, many times, and that is, well, Brother West, I don't understand. It says here that Jesus came and destroyed the works of the devil but it sure seems like he's working a lot. And there's a lot of works going on that we know who's behind it. So how did Jesus destroy the works of the devil and yet he's still around? Well, first of all, let's understand that word destroy is the Greek word luo. And it doesn't mean to annihilate or remove, destroy. It means to, actually the original word is to release or to untie like a, a tight knot that needs to be uh, released from its bondage. And so it's not a removing of the enemy, but it was taking away his power to destroy the works of the enemy. It means to render powerless, not to remove. Now, secondly, he says works. It doesn't say that Jesus came to destroy the devil. He has a purpose for leaving him where he is. He has a plan for his future, but we have to understand the purpose of God. So what was the works of the devil that Jesus came to destroy? The very word works there, the original Greek Hebrew or Greek word is ergon, and it means simply actions, past, present, and future. And so if we put it together, what this verse is telling us, that the purpose of God to send his son to die on a cross, the purpose for that was to undo, loosen and release people from the actions or works of the enemy, past, present, and future. So let's talk about that for a minute, because most of us know part of that, but we don't know the full story of that gospel good news message. So what were the works or actions of the devil? Well, most of us understand, if we start at creation, that the first action of 
Satan, was to tempt Adam and Eve into what became the fall of mankind, the beginning of a sin nature that was passed on in spiritual DNA throughout history to all who were born. And Jesus came to die to pay the penalty for that sin of fallen man. For those who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the actions of Satan in the garden are undone, released, destroyed, loosed on man that puts his trust in Christ. But I want you quickly to consider also that if Jesus came to destroy the works, luo, actions of the enemy, again, that's past, present, and future. And I don't think we went far enough past to understand the full import of what Jesus did on the cross and the purpose for which he came. Because you see, Satan was around long before Adam was created. And we have biblical record that Satan in heaven as a very high angelic being began to rebel and question God. He said, I can do it my way. Everything was about contrary to God's plan. It was a question. Is it really right that God should be in charge of everything? Tell us what to do and why. And so that question seeped out like poison in heaven long before there was an earth. And that was part of the actions or the works of Satan. So think about it. When that lie was spread in heaven to where a third of the angels became fallen angels that believed in and followed Satan in his fall from heaven. That was part of his actions, his works. And Jesus came, we just read it. He was manifested, came to the cross, not only to undo the penalty of sin, but he's also going to solve this problem in heaven. The Bible talks about the cleansing of heaven as well as earth. What needs to be cleansed in heaven? Well, it's a metaphor, but it actually has to do with God is a just God. And when this question was brought up before time in heaven, and a third of the angels looked into it and thought there was some merit to Satan's challenge against God, God decided, you know what, we'll take a couple thousand years, I've got forever, and we're going to demonstrate something that's so important. And we're going to, by so doing, undo the works of Satan in the garden that tempted man to fall and passed a sin nature on to all mankind. But also... He's going to undo the actions of Satan in heaven before we were ever created. Now, how's that going to happen? I want you to turn with me to Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, where Paul addresses this. Again, very important passage or several passages of Scripture here where Paul said that he was called, anointed, and given revelation to show people and help them, verse 9, Ephesians 3, 9, to help all men see what is the mystery and the fellowship which was from the beginning, but it was hid, hid in God. But the purpose is to the intent. This is the purpose, the intention. And now to the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God which is according to the, what, eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Oh, my friends, there's so much deep truth right here. Listen to what Paul's saying. Paul said, I've been given a revelation that goes beyond what others have seen. And he said, in, in, in that, I understand that there's a mystery that we're going to begin to see unfolding. And he said, the intent or purpose was had something to do with principalities and powers. Now we're talking now about a spiritual realm or the angelic realm. And here the Apostle Paul has a revelation and understanding that God is going to and has begun a work of manifesting his power through Jesus Christ on the cross. Paid the penalty for sin. For those who will believe in him now, we have victory over death and eternal life. But now listen carefully. Jesus also came to destroy the works prior to creation, the lie that was spewed throughout the angelic realm 
a question that may linger in the minds of many angels to this day. And God is demonstrating and showing his purpose for sending his son, which was more than just to die for our sins. Yes, it procured for us through the new covenant, healing, peace, joy, provision of every kind, but also something that we often overlook. He came to destroy the actions of Satan even before creation. And he's been in that process for several thousand years throughout our time here on earth. Now we begin to understand, even in a greater way, the purpose of God. Now listen to these words again. This is the intention of the purpose that God is going to make known his manifold wisdom. Listen to those words. He's going to demonstrate to the spirit realm, angels, both holy and fallen. All eyes will see this purpose that he sent his son, dying for our sins, providing for our salvation and eternal life, and also proving, proving that Satan's challenge against God was a lie. Now, how's he going to do that? <clears throat> this is where, my friends, you begin to really understand why we're here in the first place. Did God just create the earth and then suddenly found out, oh my goodness, I didn't, I didn't plan on there being sin and a snake in the garden and all the resulting chaos since? Oh, he knew. The Bible says that even the plan of Jesus becoming our sacrifice was before the foundation of the earth before the creation ever took place. God had a plan in mind. It wasn't a surprise. It wasn't something he had to rectify that wasn't in the original plan. The purpose of God was both to rescue man from sin, but also to remedy the lie in heaven that forevermore in eternity will never be challenged again, that God's way is the best way. Our way is a way of destruction. The sin nature and the nature of Satan to go challenge God's word is always going to leave us in a place of brokenness. And yet God said, I've sent my son and he's going to destroy all the actions of the enemy past, present, and even in your future. You know, there's a, a verse that is so powerful in the Old Testament that both the apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 preached on it and Jesus himself referred to Psalm 110 verse 1. I want you to listen to it carefully. A little strange, it says in King James, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou here at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool or your enemies are going to become your footstool. What was he talking about? Well, let's put it all together. First of all, the time frame for this is a prophetic view of the future when Jesus would not only come to undo the works of the enemy on the cross, but he has now not only died for our sins, but he has risen again, and now he is returned to the Father, and the Father says, Son, allow my paraphrase, you need to just rest now. It's all taken care of. It's finished. What you did destroyed the works of the enemy. It didn't annihilate him. He's still there and he's still accomplishing your purpose. So sit down and watch how this plays out, if you will, until I make your enemies your footstool. Now listen carefully. The Lord said unto my Lord, who's talking to who here? In the original Hebrew, it's Jehovah said to Adonai, or another way of saying it is the Father said to the Son. They are one in the Trinity, and yet here they are conversing with one another. And the Father says to the Son, Son, again, you've done well. It's finished. But I want you now to sit down beside me, a place of authority, and watch as what you did unfolds until the enemy becomes your footstool. Now, we don't understand footstool. We think it's just something we prop our feet on. But in the context of when this was written, they would have understood clearly that every king, every potentate in charge of his kingdom, when he sent his army to war, had they, if they win victory, then those captives are brought back to the kingdom 
brought before the king and the defeated king was brought before the victor before his throne and there was always a little footstool in front of the throne. Now the reason for the footstool was twofold and that was so the king could climb up on a much elevated throne so that he could be higher than his subjects. So it necessitated a step. The footstool worked for that. But there was also another reason. The foot feet could now rest because the floor is so much lower. So it was called your stool for your feet or your footstool. But there was a tradition that when one king co conquered another land, another king, that conquered king was brought before the victor and told to lay his head down on the stool, the footstool, and the king would symbolically place his foot on top of the neck of the defeated king. Therefore, we get the term, he had his foot on his neck. It became symbolic. To this day, I've traveled in India where it's very uh, egregious to in any way insult somebody with the, your foot or your shoe. You've probably seen and heard stories where people will throw shoes and there's no greater insult in those ancient cultures. And it goes all the way back here to what God was saying. So listen again. The father says to the son, good job, well done. It's finished. But now sit down because we're going to see something else. There's something else got to be completed that has to do with the enemy becoming your footstool where your feet, son, are going to be on the neck of the enemy. Is that not the first prophecy I gave in the Garden of Eden? That you were going to be bruised but it was going to be your heel. You're going to crush Satan, but your heel will be bruised. Why wasn't it your the side would be pierced? It was. Your head will, and back will be bruised with beatings. But he chose those words. Listen carefully. It had to do with his feet. Your heel will be bruised. Now you remember what Paul said about the body of Christ? the body of the Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. We are still his body though. We are his body extended into this life in the present. We become his feet. Now listen carefully. So we have a part in this bruising of Satan. Oh, I know that sounds strange, but let's stick to God's word because it, what does it say in Romans 16? Paul said to the Christians in Rome and he said, the God of peace will soon... Hasn't happened yet, he said. But the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Well, wait a minute. I thought, I thought he was already crushed. I thought Satan was already destroyed. What is Paul now saying way post-cross, way after Calvary? He's saying to believers in Rome, it hasn't happened yet, but be patient because soon the God of peace will crush Satan under your, your feet. You're going to have something to do with this. Oh, my friends, here's where the revelation explodes. The purpose of God. We were sent here not just to live a happy life, to work, come home, eat, sleep, get up and do it again. God said, I placed you here to demonstrate something to principalities and powers. My intent, my purpose was to show Satan and all the angels that believed him and all others that will view this throughout eternity, that God vindicated himself. The challenge was made. He met the challenge in a demonstration of several thousand years that not only included his son being sent to the cross to die, but now by extension, we who were left here in frail flesh to demonstrate this glorious mystery of how Christ in us could be like God in this world. How we could be Christ extended to a world and demonstrate that life is best when following God's way. It produces peace, prosperity, provision of every kind we need. And God said, I'm going to demonstrate that. I am going to take a handful of dirt. Watch this, angels. You were created in great glory, spiritual beings in the very presence of the Holy One of Israel. And yet I'll just take a handful of dirt and I'll blow my breath, my life into it. And when I do, it has a purpose, the purpose of God, because I took the weakest thing possible, dirt, 
but I put myself in that weak dirt. And I'm going to demonstrate to Satan and destroy the actions of his lies and show that even the weakest possible creation I've ever made, when I place myself within that flesh, that earthen flesh, it will demonstrate that as they live by my ways, they are blessed. Those who go contrary to my ways, they find on that broad road destruction always. And the wages of their sinful choices always produce death. And God is demonstrating this to all who are watching in a great cloud of witnesses. And think about it. You and I were chosen to be here. God selected us to be here what I believe is the final act. The curtain's about to come down. What is your part in this great demonstration? You say, but Brother Wes, I don't know how I could help God vindicate. I, I love him. I gave my life to him. But I, I've not done anything great for him. Listen, do you realize that even in your struggles, no matter what your life has been riddled with, with it, with weaknesses and failures and addiction. When you turn your heart to Christ, you are now involved in the very purpose of God. Because God is not saying, I want a people that have never sinned. He said, I want to show you people who have fallen and all have fallen and come short of the glory of God. And yet when my power flows through their life, watch how they change. Watch how their life is filled with blessing. We're demonstrating something to principalities and powers. Oh, my friends, any wonder Paul said, listen, we have this treasure, God himself, in earthen vessels. And then he tells us why. He says, so that the glory will go to the treasure, to Christ, not to the earthen vessel. It's a handful of dirt. Oh, that we could learn that. But when we submit to Christ, we find that even in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. And God is able to change us before the eyes of all the doubters. That Christ is able to change anyone from anything into an image of his glory. He makes all things beautiful in his time. He takes broken pieces and puts it back together. And all of that vindicates God. And that was his purpose for sending us. Not that we would live in a perfect world without any problems, but that we would find the source of refuge throughout the storm of this life, knowing that on the other side, we'll spend eternity with him, which was always the purpose of God. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just pray that right now that you will make so real to people that we're not just here to live out our lives and survive difficulties and somehow find blessing. But you've placed us here with a purpose to vindicate your name and to show and demonstrate not our power, but how through our surrender that we can find the very strength of Almighty God to overcome the difficulties of this life and to demonstrate before all watching eyes God's way is the only way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is everything and all there is to life. Father, we thank you for allowing us to have a part in the purpose of God. My friends, this week, keep that mindset before you. You're here for a reason. It may seem like meaningless to you, but God wants to demonstrate and bless you with his presence and with his prosperity, with his peace, so that all can see there is a God. And to follow him is the most important thing in life. That is the purpose, the purpose of God. God bless you, my friends.